welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. You got Luke. Luke, today we're looking into the B-2 Stealth Bomber, also known as Spirit. Do you know why it was called Spirit? Why is it called Spirit, Luke? I thought it was the Spirit of St. <laughs> Louis. That is I, not, not I was accurate. completely wrong. Here it had something to do with like Washington State, I believe. And oh my goodness, I totally ruined this like story. I was supposed to look really intelligent. It had something to do with something in Seattle where I don't know. You probably know why. Sorry. That was garbage, Luke. Wow, That's that like the rubbish. worst thing anyone's ever done. Why do people who wouldn't listen to this? The B-2, also known as Spirit, I don't know why, is a U.S. long-range stealth bomber. It first flew for the U.S. of A in 1989 and entered into the Air Force in 1993, Luke. That's a long time ago. That's I mean, you were probably about only 40 back then, so that's nice. I found uh, it. The Air Force 4th I... Operational B-2 is named Spirit of Washington in Seattle, Washington, in honor of the people of the state who helped make the B-2 reality. I knew I had it here somewhere. That story was just as bad as you botching it to begin with. <laughs> Why did you even add that? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> it's built and maintained by Northrop Grumman, uh, but Hughes Radar Systems, General Electric Aircraft Engine Group, and Vought Aircraft Industries are also key members of the aircraft's contractor team. And Boeing, too, as well, right? I, I saw Boeing, Boeing was associated okay. associated there as well. Um, quick history. Do you want to go through history? Do you want me to? Why don't you start the history? I know how much you'd like and it, and I'll, I'll add love in. history. Okay. So during the very, very frigid Cold War, burr, Luke... Burr. Oh, it's so cold. Um, uh, this was designed for use there for the world's first low observable or stealth strategic bomber, the B-2 Spirit. I didn't copy and paste this. Harkens back to the designs of revolutionary <laughs> engineer Jack Northrop. So apparently he came... <laughs> he it's came second, up with... It's the second time you used a word that you don't use, but go ahead. Stop it. His flying wing design apparently is a thing, was first debuted in 1949 as the YB-49, but it wasn't it wasn't taken up by the Air Force. They were like, that's stupid. Don't ever show me that again until we need you. Um, the B-2 Spirit is a multi-role bomber capable of delivering conventional and nuclear munitions. I was not aware of that, but I guess it makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, first B-2, like I said, 19, well, it was it was publicly displayed in November 22nd of 88, but the first flight was July 17th of 89. But again, the first flight doesn't necessarily mean this was like a military op operation. Mm -hmm. This was, hey, look, it actually flies, which is, you know, a pretty good thing to do. Uh, the B-2 Combined Test Force Air Force Flight Center, Edwards Air Force Base, California, is responsible for flight testing and engineering, manufacturing, and development of the B-2. The first aircraft, Spirit of Missouri, was delivered December 17th, 1993. It was like a Christmas present for exactly. the Air Force, right? Uh, fun fact for you, Luke. Shoot. The, the Whitman AFB Air Force Base, Missouri, is the only operational base for the B-2 which seems odd to me, but I guess since it does have such a gigantic area that it can travel, it's not so bad that it only has that one base, but it probably so, needs very specific setup. To make oh that yeah, happen. I'm sure. And, and you had mentioned, um, you know, it, it, during the Cold War, essentially, or, you know, I'm going to say the things that James isn't going to say. <laughs> so back door, back door in the Cold War era. Uh, Did you say we, back dooring? Back dooring. Oh, during. Okay. Doran. Uh, we needed to be able to kill some Russians. I mean, wow. that's in, in, in the Cold War. I mean, spy on them. Essentially, they said we need to be able to fly from here to there, bomb the heck out of them, and get back without refueling. So, not only is this thing, so it has a, I think I read it right, it can go 6,000 miles without refueling. And nautical can, miles. Nautical miles. And it can go 10,000 with one single refueling, which I don't know why I wouldn't double it and make it 12. <laughs> I said sure. the same thought when thought that, that happened. I, I, I know someone's going to write in and tell us. I but. thought that was a little weird. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, so it, 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 and it actually holds the world record. So fun fact, let me go to my fun fact section Ooh, here. I love this. Uh, so it has the record. It flew 70 hours consecutively and they did make a pit stop because there's only two pilots on this thing. There's there's two cats in the whole thing. So how big, is that consecutively plane. then? Well, they didn't shut the engine off. It's like they pulled up, it's like they pulled up, you know, did did a little fire drill around it, got gotcha. back in. And uh, yeah, so it, it's safe. It, the engines ran consecutively for 70 hours with just a quick stop for uh, for pilot change. Isn't that crazy? And this was back that in- That really is. Um, it was in 2001. Uh, they flew to yeah. Afghanistan um, yep. to do some support and some bombing, I imagine. Some so. support. We're going to just call it support. We'll call it support. So back to my quick history, which was too long for Luke. Uh, compact of, the combat effectiveness, as Luke would say, bombing the heck out of people of the B-2 was proven in Operation Allied Force in 1999 where this is really kind of neat. It was responsible for, well, I guess not everyone thinks it was neat. It was responsible for destroying 33% of all Serbian targets in the first eight weeks, even though it flew only 1% of the total missions, which that's seems pretty effective. So first of all, this thing's supersonic. You, you can't see it. Radar can't see it. it flies, I thought it wasn't supersonic. It flies super high. Uh, I, I thought, thought it was it, subsonic. Maybe it is oh. subsonic. I thought I said... It's pretty fast regardless, it's, and you still fast. can't spot it. It says high subsonic. You're right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. but yeah, uh, like you said, 6,000 nautical miles. If you haven't checked out our, what is it, like weird units of measure yeah. or whatever, go check that one out, because I think we talk about nautical miles there. Um, you also mentioned that it flew to Afghanistan and back is like the longest mission that was during Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, the B-2's low observ observability is derived from a combination of reduced infrared, acoustics, electromagnetics, visual and radar signatures, which I think you're probably going to get into yeah, a we'll little bit more little bit about else. that. Uh, yeah, so these signatures make it difficult for the sophisticated defense systems to, to, tra to track it uh, and engage with it, especially trying to blast it out of the air. Uh, many aspects of the low observab observability process remain classified, and um, that flying wing design also contributes to the stealthiness. I did notice, though, Luke, if anybody hasn't checked out our SR-71 episode, it was very interesting i mean all of our episodes are interesting it was really good but it is clearly different than the b2 which still has a lot of classified stuff because the amount of content available for the b2 is far less than the sr-71 well, had and my guess is the b2 is active so it, it, it is yeah so the the, the sr-71 blackbird has been retired and you know doesn't yeah. fly anymore so, but it is uh, interesting how it's still like not yeah. easy to find a bunch and i would guess most of the things like they say it's high subsonic i guarantee you this thing is supersonic and they just don't say it is it's, it's you get I, the I, unprofessional engineering zero seal of approval on that fact yeah so <laughs> um, a couple other things luke a Dude. new transportable hangar system was developed which allows the b2 to be deployed to forward locations overseas so I feel like these hangars are kind of a bit of an engineering accomplishment as well, mm -hmm. because they're massive. They're 126 feet long, 250 feet wide, 55 feet tall to house these beasts. Uh, and the first one was erected in Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Um, so that's pretty cool. But one not so fun fact. Are you ready for this? Shoot. On the 23rd of February, 2008. Was 2008 a leap year? I bet it I was. No. A B-2 stealth bomber crashed shortly after takeoff from the Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, the first crash in the aircraft's history. The two pilots ejected safely from the aircraft, which was not carrying munitions, so that's good. The fleet was grounded pending the results of the investigation, um, and they were returned on April 2008. Uh, there was released the incident report in June of that year, which concluded, this is scary to me, the crash was caused by moisture in the port transducer units. I don't know what that means, but moisture doesn't seem good. These sensors sent distorted information to the air data system, and this resulted in the crash. Like, 
I'd be concerned. Like, well, how's that happening? I know yeah. I don't want a moist transducer. So I, <laughs> I mean, oh, thanks. I don't think thanks anybody that, wants like. one of those. Uh, no, so I have a couple I additional, so. like I'll call them general characteristics, not cut and cut and paste from okay. another website. So from your memory, from my memory. So, uh, these things are powered by four general electric F 118 GE 100 engines. These things are turbo fans. Like we could like look into like just these engines alone. They are number one. They're beautiful. Like I appreciate like really cool looking oh. mechanical things. They're beautiful engines. Um, the thrust of each engine is 17,300 pounds. So about as much as I bench. Um, <laughs> sorry, you were drinking water as I said that. Give, um, give or take, yes. Give or take. Uh, so the wingspan is uh, 52 meters or 172 feet. Uh, the length is... 20.9 meters 69 feet and the height this thing's only 5.1 meters which is 17 feet they weigh Out about 100 as tall as me exactly uh they they weigh about 160,000 pounds uh the fuel capacity is 167,000 pounds they can hold 4,000 40,000 pounds of bombs um, it's a lot of bombs. Their, their range is obviously intercontinental based off of the 6,000 mile range without refueling. Uh, you only need two people to, to drive this thing, which is interesting because the SR-71 was, a, there was two pilots on the SR-70, uh, on the Blackbird as well. Um, and here's the, the thing that's bananas. So this thing costs about $2 billion to build. Like, that is crazy. I, I saw 157 in one spot. I saw 2 billion in another. And guess how many there are? Don't look. Cheater. Oh, I, I, I knew, so I'm not going to guess. So there's, tw there's 20. Tw the original. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. 21 of them. Uh, two are active and one they use to do all the crazy uh, black ops testing that no one knows about. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, we have to take a quick break, but first, one fun fact for you. Shoot. Those awesome engines that you were lusting over. Yes. Uh, they have an exhaust temperature control system as well to go along with all of this power to minimize the thermal signature of this thing as it's blasting through the air. So we'll just making it that. even sneakier. Ah, mm -hmm. so cool. Okay, so before we go any further, it is time for a word from our sponsor. Who do we got? Northrop Grumman, Boeing... The, the B-2 bomber, they're actually providing us with one to put our, like, our, wrap on. Our front. Yes. Um, no, no sponsor this week, which oh. is a shame. But we do have some shout-outs. Who do we got? I, I'm going to botch this one, oh, and they even told me how to pronounce their name. A day. It's pronounced U-H-B-A-Y. A day, right? Okay, makes sense. A day M. Um, will be an incoming freshman for 2022 majoring in chemical engineering. I've lived in Michigan for two years, originally from California, and currently working, worrying over college, even though I haven't even applied yet. Oh. I feel I fell in love with the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, but I have a slim chance of being accepted there, in my opinion, which, you know, it's a competitive school. I don't blame you. Is There is another school, Kettering, that he loves really small really expensive so what's your opinion on this should i even intend to go to school in michigan or just attend community college in california and then transfer to uc davis so i either wrote back or i'm in mid response to this email but personally if i understood the situation correctly it sounds like you have in-state tuition options like you're probably a resident in michigan at this point right and after two years. So if that is the case, I say go for it. What's the worst that happens? Michigan says no. Um, so that feels like an okay thing to me. If you listen to any of our what is engineering's, Michigan's always in the list and the in-state super affordable compared to the 50 something thousand out of state tuition there. So I say go for it and apply. What's the worst that's happening? I don't understand the California thing. If you still have in-state tuition there as well, we all know that those schools are super affordable based off of our episodes. So yeah. apply away. Kettering, I, 
sounds really expensive. I yeah, don't know. I feel like if, if you have the option for in-state tuition versus out-of-state tuition, it's literally a no-brainer unless you're getting a scholarship yeah. uh, or something like that. Because it really because the reality is, I don't think and it, it, it does happen, but like once you have that degree, you know, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, whatever it is, I highly doubt, oh, unless it's like an MIT, CMU, like one of like the top four or five engineering schools in the US, it doesn't matter what school you graduated from. Yeah, especially else? after you get that first job or two under your belt. Yeah, one exactly. more. Uh, John R. Love the podcast. I've been listening for about two months now, picking episodes at random. I listen to about four episodes a day when I'm on field assignment. And I wanted to say, I love what you guys are doing. Thanks, John. I'm a geotechnical engineer. I think that's a fancy way to say civil. Based in Canada. We have a lot of Canadian listeners. 50% no. field, 50% office. And I've been listening to the podcast on drives and flights to sites across the country. As a suggestion, Maybe it would be interesting to cover some of the disasters in the engineering world. It's a little dark, but I like it. Uh, in the geotech world, there was a deadly dam collapse that happened recently. The San Brumadino Tailings Dam. Nailed it, yep. This is one of those earthen dams, I believe. So maybe this is the second time we've mentioned John. I don't know, because he also said he wrote in, and I probably ignored that email. I didn't ignore it, John. I'm just that far behind on emails. Months. You are. Uh, anyways, I love the idea. I love disasters, and that's that's a shame. Um, I don't know if we've ever done a disasters episode. I can't recall. I don't think we have. Because we're positive people. Anyways, if any of you have any suggestions for episodes, if you'd like some advice for me to, you know, just ruin your career and your future <laughs> life in college or just anything else, why don't you go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, share. And as always, we love the reviews and you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast anytime. Anytime. What's up next, Luke? All righty. So uh, I want to get into like the radar, avoiding radar thing, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. so this thing has, I mentioned it, it, it has a hundred and 72 foot wingspan so th this this isn't a small plane I feel like i could see it oh you could definitely see it uh so the so the question is well how does it avoid radar the, the reality is i don't think we really know because pretty much everything that i found online was like suspicion or suspected or probable because this but is internet doesn't particularly yeah, know <laughs> i mean this is th th this is probably you know, you mentioned it before, like all this stuff is still super classified. We can't be, you know, letting other countries uh, know how and why we're doing this stuff. So, um, but basically there, there's two kind of primary things that are involved in the radar detection. So the first one is just what the plane is made out of. I think you may have mentioned, um, I think you did. Uh, so this is actually made up of carbon fiber with resin, they believe. I'm sure it's made out of like antonanium or antinonium or whatever. Vibranium, or, vibranium or, or something. It's probably that. You know. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. But it, it's some sort of carbon fiber resin reinforced surface. So number one, anything that would I'll say reflect really easily like metal or steel or glass, like all that stuff is pretty much internal. So um, it still does have a kind of traditional internal structure, um, but they also use all kinds of uh, absorbing paint and materials uh, on the actual body itself, the exterior. And they actually have to reapply this stuff. So the paint that you see there is, it isn't just like Sherwin Williams paint, like that they're just getting like this, <laughs> this, you know, you know, uh, B2 black or something like that. It's really specialized paint that they said probably has some type of, which doesn't make sense, some kind of like iron in it because iron would absorb the radio waves, but I would think it would reflect. So uh, so lots of things to like dampen. So if you think of like curtains in your bedroom to like absorb sound, because essentially what radar does, you got to kind of think what radar does. So these antennas basically go pew, 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 and they shoot these radio waves up in the sky. And, that's what and, they do. and then they wait for the returning bounce off of the object and they collect that and then they can pinpoint where you are based off of this stuff happens in split seconds. Um, 
So all of this absorbs the material. Then the second part of it is the actual shape of the plane itself. So if you look at this thing, there isn't a flat surface on the airplane at all. It's, it's convex and concaved and super smooth and rounded. And the idea is if you, if, if you think of like when you shine a light in a mirror, it, it comes right back. But if you tilt that mirror at 45 degrees, the light reflects not where the light source is coming from. So if every surface is curved, only a really small bit of that reflective radio wave is going to go back. And that's why they said the cross section on radar is about the size of a bird. Isn't that crazy? So this thing's a 172 bird. feet and they think yeah, it's like a little bird? bird. Like a robin or like <laughs> why would you a bald ask me eagle. Why? E either way, it's like... It should be like a bald eagle. It should be America. Yeah, America. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so those are the two kind of primary ones, and then a whole bunch of like secondary ones that we can talk about. So, uh, obviously, it's made of advanced composites that, you know, my guess is the general population doesn't have magical access to. stuff. Magical Aliens. stuff. Um, we talked about the paint. The engines are mounted internally, so you don't see the actual engine at all. Uh, they're silent. So the way the engines, so if you ever had a flyover, you can hear a jet coming before it actually gets there. And they say these, when they do flyovers for events or in movies, a lot of times you don't even know they're coming because they're like, yeah. and they just fly over and you don't even know. So you mentioned the exhaust ports and I want to oh. talk about um, the Venturi effect. Oh. So if, so on the top of the airplane, there is an inlet. So that's where the cold air comes in to the engine. And then it does all the, all the combustion stuff happens. And then it would shoot out normally super high temperature gases and thermal detection would be able to pick that up. But they thought yeah. of this, James. Yeah, they did. So what they did was they developed these mechanisms that take advantage of the Venturi effect. So what the Venturi effect is, you got air coming in, it basically downsizes it to a cone. So the pressure goes down and the speed goes up because it's low pressure. Atmospheric pressure rushes in. So it draws in cold Hi, external cold. air, yeah. whatever the current air temperature is. And they said the air at the exhaust port is almost the exact same temperature as the air at the inlet port. So like you could hold your hand at the exhaust. That's like crazy. a boss and it's that not going to so burn nuts. your hand off. Yeah, Venturi you know effect. who came up with this? Fun fact: hmm. Ace Venturi. Ace Venturi. <laughs> That's not accurate. That's not ah, accurate at why all. did I even say that? That is really uh, fascinating, though. Yeah. Anything so, else that you wanted to no, talk so, about? No, like th those are kind of the the radar reducing things that that make this plane invisible, essentially. I'd like to talk about some of its weapons. Shoot. <laughs> did Literally. There. Should yeah, I do my was, rant though? That was good. Yeah, Luke, go ahead. Yeah, let's hear it. Let's so take a break. Is, so this isn't a rant. This is more of like an excited moment for me. Okay. Uh so today is 10 21 21. Tomorrow the movie Dune is being oh, released. Oh, how about that? And I am a huge Dune fan. The original, like 1980s version was 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 a little trippy, uh, but it was really good. I've never been able to read the books because they're literally like, like a thousand pages. There's multiple versions of it. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to because friend of the show, Jason Mimosa, he was here in Pittsburgh not that long ago shooting a, mm -hmm. a Netflix movie called Sweet Girl. He I stopped think. by to see me. Yeah. He did. He hung out. Uh, mm. My problem with it is they got Timothy Chalamet, who my daughter loves and I despise as an actor. And it's just because oh, he's... Is. He's just like a good looking young actor guy that like all the young like teenage me. girls, exact opposite of you. Um, oh. So I'm looking forward to the movie and it's just like, I'm torn because like, here's this actor that I really like, Jason Mimosa, and then this one that I can't stand. And I, and uh, so, yeah, I'm looking I'm forward to it. So I, I think I'm going to see the movie maybe Sunday night. We'll see. Good luck. Let me know. We'll have to get an unprofessional review on that. Sounds good. Awesome. So some weapons, Luke, some weapons. Pew, pew, uh, pew. That is the right sound. Machine guns. The B-2 is fitted with two separate weapon bays at the center of the aircraft. It can carry, like you said, 40,000 in weapons, 
bomby bombs, um, including conventional and nuclear weapons, precision guided munitions, gravity bombs, and range of maritime weapons. So um, each weapon bay is equipped with a rotary launcher and two bomb rack assemblies. Uh, it can successfully release B61 and 83 nuclear devices and MK84 conventional bombs with this rotary lo rocket launcher, which is pretty fascinating. If you have a chance to check out a video on that, do so. Um, it can also carry the AGM-129 advanced cruise missile, which is a strategic cruise missile with a range of a measly 1,500 miles. Uh, and up to 16, like the missiles themselves, you should do an episode on. It can hold up to 16 satellite guided JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition Missiles. Um, but it's actually being converted, and it may have been already, to have new smart configuration for the bomb racks, which will increase the number of, the, of these uh, Joint Direct Missiles munitions from 16 to 80. So I don't know who's doing this smart rack design, but they're doing a heck of a job increasing the capacity. Um, in 2007, Northrop was awarded the contract to integrate the Boeing Massive Ordnance Penetration Penetrator, the MOP weapon on the B-2. Um, it's a GPS guided uh, system. It contains 2,400 kilograms of explosives and is designed to penetrate hardened deepened buried targets. So even if there's bunkers under the ground, the bomber is going to just be able to- Bunker busters, I think they're called. Eliminate those, yeah. So uh, they do have some other great things that I guess I would consider great and people getting hit by them probably do not agree with uh, that they can carry, but I am going to stop there and let you see if there's anything else you wanted to talk I about. I have one last thing that if you want to throw in all your rest of your weapons. So- uh, I'm going to make this a little bit of a game. Yeah. So I want you to tell me okay. if the B-2 bomber was in this movie or not. Because apparently, you can just call up the it's Air Force in a bunch. and be like, hey, this I need This made you. no sense to me. I, I, so for, for, for a top secret aircraft, the fact that we put it in these movies. So you saw I this. So, so you know the list of movies. So this isn't going to work. Yeah, it's not. Oh, I can, okay. I, I can try and not. No, no, no. Go ahead. Uh, so the list it's of movies, it's very interesting. So, and I remember only two of them. So this was in, uh, and this is not, I don't think every single one, but the, the big one. So Independence Day, uh -huh. um, Armageddon, uh -huh. Iron Man 2, Cloverfield, uh -huh. uh, Airplanes, um, I don't. I don't know if they mean like the cartoon, the Disney cartoon. I, I don't. I don't know what airplanes I don't know is. That. Uh, Rampage was a big white monkey movie with The Rock, I think. Which yeah. I, I I didn't even watch that movie, so I don't know. And then the one I do, and then the one I remember, the other one. So I remember Armageddon and Captain Marvel. I remember it in Captain Marvel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and think about how long ago that like Independence Day and then Captain Marvel. I mean. That's a long lifespan right there for this B2 to yeah, show. Yeah, they've up. been around a while. And it's still like this super technologically advanced thing. Like no one in the world other than us has these. You think so. the B2 is embarrassed that it was in Rampage? I mean, that's... yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it's bad. I mean, it's okay. the rock, right? You know. Yeah. Oh, Dwayne. Dwayne, if you're listening, I, I like you. So there's that. Um, the future, Luke, look into the future. And this was the future a long time ago, so it's probably already happened. There was a report in 2011, and again, it's hard to get confirmation on this stuff. Uh, the Pentagon was evaluating an unmanned stealth bomber characterized as the mini B-2 as a potential replacement in the future. Uh, I don't think that's happened yet, or at least the world doesn't know about it if that were the case. But I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, the 2012 projections, it was estimated that the next generation bomber would have an overall cost of $55 billion. Oh, yeah. For one. <laughs> I think maybe that had to do with the retrofitting and redesign to make it unmanned and then, you know, some delivery. Well, the other uh, thing too, that's, that, that's a little crazy and, and it, it's kind of a fun fact, but when they started making these B2s, the reason why it was there was so expensive was like they didn't have the soft they had to develop the software to Northrop do developed 
the analysis. Everything from scratch. They developed the software laboratories, the yeah. tools, the composites, yeah. the test equipment, the 3D CAD systems, like, the, like, the everything. Exactly. There, there were, I mean, it's just the, the equipment didn't exist before the program started. So mm -hmm. you're welcome, yeah. everybody. That's that's right. Everybody that loves CAD. Um, a few more fun facts for you. Uh, beast mode, longest aerial combat. So you talked about that um, 44 hour mission. You talked about the movies, intercontinental range, 6,000 miles, you said, payload over 20 tons. And then one last fun fact for you. Uh, it is number one, meaning it shows up first on site for these missions. It shows up at night, it checks everything out. It did so for Operation Allied Force, Iraqi Freedom and Odyssey Lightning. It's always our go-to long range combat and spying plane. So all really interesting stuff. Luke, anything else from you? Mm, I wish I was a pilot. You think so? Yeah, because yeah. I did you know how cool that would be to like fly yeah. to Russia and fly back. And you get those cool jackets, which is oh really my, like, like those bomber jackets. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah, really. We should get on professional engineering bomber jackets. <laughs> Stamp of approval. All right. If any of you have some money that you want to give to us to buy some sweet jackets or just want to give us a sweet b2 bomber go ahead and do that reach out to us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com and until next time see ya